Well, now for the absolutely best part of the day, um, at least my day, but I am willing to bet that it's going to be the best part of most of your days as well. And that's a high order because today's been pretty fabulous. And we've heard from a whole lot of wonderful speakers. Um, I have the distinct honor of introducing our closing speaker today, who is Peter, um, Dr. Peter Jacques. And over the last year, I have had the privilege of working with Peter um, individually, with his family, with his organization, um, Revive South Sudan. Um, Peter has, over the last few years, he is an economist. He's been named one of the young leaders um, of the world. He worked for the DOD's Africa Center. He's worked for the National Endowment for Democracy, for the World Bank. Um, he is a colleague, but he has also become a friend. Um, he's an energizing, hope-inspiring, passion-instilling, and impossible person to get off the phone with, friend. <laughs> Um, I have dedicated my career to human rights as many of you in this room, if not all of you have, um, whether it was overseas or with the US government or now from the private sector. Um, and many people have asked me why, why human rights? And I'm sure you all have been asked similar questions and why investigations into human rights violators or kleptocrats or national security, what have you. And my answer is always the same. It has been from the very, very beginning. Um, what has always struck me is not how different people are, but how absolutely similar they are. Um, it is what people foundationally want that is so similar, a family, um, the right to be respected, the right to be treated fairly, um, the right to have a house um, and meaningful employment. And what I think a common trend from today has been is this tendency when people start talking about human rights or human trafficking or forced labor is to think about somebody over there, um, somebody who is in some far offshore that's not really affecting us here. And what is incredible about my friend Peter is that he does not allow that. Um, Peter is walking optimism and he is really pragmatic and measured hope um, from the depths of sufferance, which he has experienced a lot of. And those of us who know him and his story um, know that intimately. Um, he walks now with the weight of what I think is just a beautiful but determined responsibility um, that we have to each other, not to someone over there, but here. And he's really the voice that I hope we all leave today with in our heads. Um, so without further delay, Peter. Well, thank you very much, uh, Renata, for that very generous uh, uh, introduction. Uh, it's really a great privilege and an honor for me to be present here and also to be offering closing remarks uh, on this really wonderful conference. I really enjoyed uh, listening to different experts on this topic of, uh, of supply chain and the issues of forced labor and slave labor. Uh, these are challenges that many people deal with in different parts of the world. Uh, so I've been thinking about what would I add to this wonderful conversation where so many experts uh, have shared uh, incredible information, uh, whether they are from the US government perspective or from the private sector. Um, the point that I want to talk about as I reflect about all of this, uh, given what we have heard, we have heard about the requirements uh, that the companies are required uh, when it comes to compliance, when it comes to doing the due diligence, and the options that they have, uh, options of helping their partners who are maybe engaged in these kinds of violations uh, to improve and get better at doing what they, they are doing, or options of walking away sometime when there is no opportunity uh, for that to happen. Now, I think obviously there is great value that is added when the, the, the companies that are engaged in this violation improve, particularly in countries where there is a good will on the side of the state actors to improve things and make them better. And maybe sometimes the challenge they have is a challenge of capacity. They may not have the bureaucratic capacity to understand the scale of the challenge that they're engaged with and or uh, a, a deeper understanding of the kind of policies that can be implemented or implementation problem. Now in those environments, indeed, uh, doing this work that is required here can have an impact and it can lead to a better outcome. But from my experience, 
And from a lot of things that we have heard, it seems like there are three types of regimes that we are dealing in different parts of the world where these violations are happening. The first is weak state that we talked about where there are government leaders that care to a certain extent about the welfare of their people, but may not have the capacity to effect change or to hold companies accountable for these violations. And in that environment, as I just said, changes can be made by a lot of the things that we have talked about today. But in the other two cases, the other two kinds of regimes where you have strong states that are authoritarians and that do not care about the welfare of their people. There's a lot of reference here that has been made to China and we understand the situation there. China is not a failed state, not a weak state. It's a strong state, but we see these uh, these terrible uh, atrocities being committed there. That is one example. The other one is at the extreme side where you have weak state that are essentially become extreme form of kleptocracy. There are states that have uh, been affected by state capture, where its entire state essentially become a criminal organization. And in those cases, everything that we are talking about here, and ultimately there will be no change and what would happen is the companies then are forced to leave. And from the experience that we went through in Sudan, that sometimes doesn't lead to better outcome. Take example of what happened in Sudan in the early 2000s. You know, when the oil was, cut, was discovered in Sudan, it was actually American company, Chevron, that discovered oil in Sudan. When the oil began being exported in the 1997, one of the companies that was involved in the, in the consortium was a, a Canadian company called Talisman. And there was a huge uproar here in the United States and around the world when evidence emerged of the involvement of the Sudanese government in war crimes and burning down villages, forcing people away to make space for the oil companies to come and do exploration. Now, what happened afterwards, Talisman was forced out. And Talisman then sold its shares in this consortium to Chinese and Malaysian companies, which then move in into Sudan. I can tell you today, the situation is far worse than it was during Talisman. Why? Because the Chinese companies and the Malaysian companies absolutely do not care whatsoever about human rights violation, war crimes, or environmental problems. In fact, the technologies that they're using now to extract our oil are absolutely horrific. Uh, they dump waste everywhere. And in this part of Sudan, uh, South Sudan now, the soil is very flat. So when it rains, uh, and when there is a high discharge of water from Lake Victoria into the Nile, there is flood. And this water then comes and mixed with this oil waste. And then it basically goes everywhere into the farmlands, into the rivers, causing enormous human uh, tragedy in our country. So sometimes walking away may not necessarily uh, be the best way to do things. Because why do we care about forced labor or human rights to begin with? It's not just simply because it is required. Of course it is required when, and when you are a company, you don't want to do something that is illegal or something that is going to put you into problem. But I think there is a deeper reason why we care about this. And this is because of our own consign. There are certain values that we hold for ourselves and for our fellow beings. And walking away sometimes does not add or change things for the people that we are supposed to care about. We are really supposed to care about those locals who are being exploited, whose situation is being made horrific each and every passing day. So in this context of failed state or strong state that simply do not care about the welfare of their people, there need to be other things that need to be done beyond what is required. What is required by the US government, whether it is treasury or so forth. And even when we see action from the side of the US government, that action sometimes is not consistent. Right? So we had, there was a great session earlier on sanctions and especially on global Magnitsky. And sometimes you wonder when the US government has the absolutely best information on the kind of violation that are being committed, absolutely horrific. Renata was kind enough to talk about what I endured 
in my struggle for better South Sudan. I was arrested, spent two years uh, in prison. Half of that time I spent in solitary confinement in a cell that was literally one by one meter where I could not lie with my, stretch my body when I lie down. The only time I stretch my body is by standing where light was turned off every two, every two weeks and then turned on constantly for another two weeks. All kinds of violation happening there. And, the, and, the, and individuals responsible for these are known at the highest level of US government. I appear before the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and spoke about the scale of these abuses in South Sudan. Yet those individuals up to today have never been held accountable. So there is that problem that is not even, and we, we wonder why. Is it because there are other interests behind or, 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 or what the issue is? But they raise issue of consistency and, the, and, and question the, the moral ground from which the US government stand to speak about the abuses that are happening all over the world as we are witnessing now in Ukraine. So if governments are unable to act in one case, why is it then, then they should act in another? And it raised the issue of moral consistency. So that is one. But I think private sector should go beyond what the US government can do. And sometimes there are good things that the US government does, but the private sector has the ability to go more. And the issue that I want us to think about is when we talk about forced labor, when we talk about child labor, slave labor, trafficking, and all of these things, broadly, the issues of human rights and where they occur are in environments where there are regime in power that are illegitimate and do not care about the welfare of their people. One such regime is the regime we have in South Sudan. And many of you remember when South Sudan gained independence, the excitement, I was speaking with a young lady over there who happened to visit Juba around that time, where people were united. They were looking forward to a new beginning. But now South Sudan is completely failed state. You, you don't even have ability to speak up. The main reason why I was detained was demanding that we should have free and fair elections. This is a country that literally became a state because of the support of the United States, Britain and Norway, some of the leading democracies in the world. Yet 10 years later on, it has not held elections. The government we have now is the government of warlords. Literally, you have to go to the bush, kill people, and then demand a seat at a negotiation table so that you are brought into the government. It's such a weird government. We have five vice presidents, five vice presidents. Imagine, each of which represent a warring faction. That's the kind of regime that we have. So if we want to do more than simply do what is required, we have to think about promoting democracy because democratic regimes care about the welfare of their people. If they hear stories about child labor, forced labor, there will be uproar and they will be forced to take action. This is what we really need to think about in the long term, because we can try to focus on what is required by this statute or that statute and try to be compliant as much as we can, but that will never ultimately solve the problem. What will solve the problem is if those regimes that do not care about their people, that thrive on exploiting them, if those regimes do not remain in power. And as President Biden mentioned uh, last December when he hosted the Democracy Summit, what is emerging now in the world, as we have seen with what is happening in Ukraine, is really a struggle between democracy on one hand and authoritarianism on the other. And for long, both the US government and the companies and the public at large have basically left these struggles to those of us embedded in those societies. And they say they will handle it. But we are not just only struggling against our own government. Our government have behind them, like it is the case now in South Sudan, Chinese companies that are bribing money, pouring in billions of dollars to basically prop up those regimes, Russian mercenaries in the form of Wagner Group, which is present in South Sudan, training the intelligence services, 
and is now present in different parts of the continent. This is what we are struggling against. And it can't just be left to us in such an environment where literally people are detained or shot on the street to bring about a better future. We need support, not just only from the US government, but also from American public and the American corporation. So if there's one thing that I want to share with you is that the only way we can ultimately eradicate these kinds of abuses uh, from anywhere in the world is by promoting democracy. Thank you very much. And let's go and have some drinks. Peter, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time because as Peter said, me, drinks, we need to go that way and also continue our conversation. I do very much though want to thank Catholic University uh, for partnering with us and us allowing us to partner with them on this, uh, hopefully the first of a number of opportunities for us to pull together uh, all of the constituents and stakeholders who have a commitment to human rights it is, despite um, the clarity that a lot of us see in terms of how to get to the end game, there are complexities, there are challenges. We have a confluence of kleptocracy, a lack of rule of law where there is rule of law, it's not enforced, bribery, corruption, human rights, all of this converges. And it's interesting when Martina was talking about the FCPA and the, and the increase in enforcement of the FCPA came out of the Watergate scandal. Um, and, but, but a lot of companies at the time were saying, but we're at a disadvantage, right? We've, we're at a disadvantage globally. And so the international community came together through OECD and the United Nations and others to really focus on bribery and corruption. And I am heartened in a bit, uh, although cautiously optimistic, that with this really renewed focus on human rights under the broader umbrella of environmental social governance and human rights, an understanding and recognition of the need for all stakeholders to come together, including governments, including corporations, civil society, that we will be able to come to some coalescence around the, the protocols, the procedures, policies, the accountability. Every single speaker spoke in terms of the need for accountability and, and, and how we're gonna achieve that accountability. So um, I, I wanna thank you all for sticking with us. I know it's been a long day, but it's been such an exciting day for me um, to hear all the speakers and to really feel very rejuvenated in terms of purpose, goals, and objectives. And now I hope you'll join us uh, for the reception out in the atrium. Thank you very much.